My talk is entitled 1.3 million reasons to get out of bed in the morning. And that's because the subject that I wanted to tackle actually results in 1.3 million deaths a year. It's actually the ninth biggest cause of death in the world, which is quite surprising if you think about it, because giving an injection is given by a healthcare worker, someone that you trust, someone that you really put your, your life forward to, and you don't expect it to result in a statistic like this and put it up at that scale. I'm going to give you a few examples. This lady that I met in Islamabad had been burnt in a dowry burning, um, uh, an attack on her several years before, about 10 years before. And she had been treated for uh, the burn. And during the process of this treatment, she had been infected with hepatitis B. And here she is, 10 years later, being treated for the hepatitis after her burn had recovered. But the treatment had maimed her for life and her family and had cost an awful lot of uh, uh, not only money but social consequences to her. These four children I met in a, in a very happy orphanage in Delhi and they were all HIV infected and what was so sad as I've said is they were in an orphanage because once they became infected their family had no way of coping with that social pressure and threw them out on the streets. They were all infected by an injection, and sadly, two of them are no longer with us. This is what happens. Here's a syringe with the scale worn off the barrel, and in my opinion, this has been used over 100 times, and this is a syringe that you see lying in a clinic um, anywhere in the world that, uh, that during my work that I see. They use like pens and scissors. This handsome man, hello doctor, how are you? Um, show me the syringe you've been using today and he proudly picks up one syringe before he realizes that I've taken his photograph. I gave him a quick punch and ran as fast as I could because <laughs> there were some other people in the clinic. These needles are meant to be used in a hospital and you can see that they're not in a blister pack. And actually when you open the needle, they were all wet. There was a systemic reuse in the hospital where they were taken downstairs, washed roughly, who knows, and then put back in the, in the ward to be used. This is a needleizer that's meant to destroy the needles after use. And then some bizarre examples. This is a toy seller in Indonesia. Um, and there are 200,000 schools in Indonesia. Each one of them has a fast food sort of restaurant, a little station where you can buy noodles, etc. And they also have toy sellers. And on the, on the rack there, you can see that there are syringes. This boy wants them for Christmas. And what they use them for is to play this very quite complicated game of water pistols and they have a scoring system and it's great fun and they're all laughing and giggling. When they went inside, uh, they put the syringes down and you can see that one of them's blood stained. there's rubbish inside the barrels and it got me to think, where did these come from? So we got the toy seller, bundled him into a four-wheel drive and said, take us to your supplier. He took us to this place, which was a toy wholesaler and you can see in the middle compartments there, there are um, syringes wrapped up next door to the tanks and the crackers and whatever else they can buy. And outside at the back, there were these three kids who were the owner's children washing these syringes. They were used, they were being delivered every day in bulk. These children were, their job was to wash them out and get them ready to be sold as toys. And ironically, as at, at twice the price that you could go and buy a sterile syringe from the clinic down the road. There's an industry behind all this, and these children don't go to school, they already have a job, and that's collecting medical waste. Um, and while I was taking these photographs, I also met their father, who had picked up a syringe to show me um, how easy it is to, uh, to recycle them. But while he was doing that, the needle pricked his finger. He whipped out a box of matches, there's the syringe, lit one, and burnt the bead of blood that was coming from the needle puncture that had occurred and said, it's okay now, I'm safe from HIV, and actually had that false impression. Recycling takes place on enormous scale. This is in China, some photographs that we've got, and you can see the amount of uh, money that there must be, the false um, safety issue, the, the likelihood that you know these are all going to be contaminated, and if they're, if they're not, there's a high chance that um, 
they will be contaminated by being mishandled during this re reprocessing. And these are packaged again and sent back out to clinics and, and hospitals in the local area. In 1984, I read a newspaper article which predicted one day uh, syringes would be a major cause for viruses like HIV. Sadly, as now it's identified as the ninth biggest cause of death, you can see that that prediction has come true. I spent three years from 1984 researching the problem. I was very, very um, interested in, in why this problem existed, but I suppose what I want to leave behind with you at the end of this talk is that the most important thing I believe in any of this sort of social innovation or social entrepreneur or inventing, um, leading a campaign type work is that you've really got to understand the, the problem. And as we've just heard, the complexity behind these problems really has to be understood. So what I did was I spent three years not picking up on solutions at all, but completely concentrating on what the problem was and trying to solve that. And, and then I could try and solve that. But until you know the full variety of it. And actually, even though I say that, I didn't quite get to the bottom of it at the beginning. I invented a product called K1. This is it. And as it's a smallish theater, I can show you. This is uh, the, the trick behind it, which I uh, came to the conclusion of from looking at uh, th this three-year uh, problem search, is that you have to make this syringe on existing machinery for the same price, and it has to be used in the same way. That was my mantra, if you like. And the syringe is made on existing machinery for the same price and used in the same way. So you use it in exactly the same way you would any other syringe. And if you try and refill it and reload it, the plunger snaps and it's left um, so it can't be used again. And this is termed as an auto-disable syringe. We've now got 14 manufacturers around the world. We're the, by far the biggest. Every other, there's five other designs which are quite successful, but they only have one factory each. And we have 14 making these around the world. We've made over 4 billion. Um, since 2001. It took me 17 years to sell the first one. Then we sold 4 billion and it's climbing. And we've been credited with around 10 million lives or 10 million infections saved. Despite meeting the great and the good, the presidents, the prime ministers, the ministers of health around the world, we're still at a very poor penetration. I decided to jump out of the commercial side of licensing this product around the world and start an organization called SafePoint because we had only reached 5% market penetration outside of a very organized market called immunization. I went to the World Health Organization a couple of years ago, and I've been trying to go to the World Health Organization for 29 years, since 1984, but no one would listen to me. And this time they did, and I came up with a cunning plan. And my plan that I presented to the Director General was that we couldn't just pick out one particular element here and work on it. So we couldn't go to manufacturers and say, let's all make safer syringes. It wasn't enough of a trigger point. We couldn't go to patients and say, hey, be careful. You can't have unsafe injections. It's dangerous for you. We had to actually look at this holistically from the start all the way through to the end. And there was a fundamental mistake that I had made way back when I was studying the problem in that I thought making a better product was enough. I thought it was obvious that everyone should wear a safety belt, clean their teeth with their own toothbrush, open a Coca-Cola in front of themselves so that they knew it was safe. I thought this was going to translate into a really big business. But in fact, it didn't for several reasons. One, syringes are commodities, so they have very low margins and therefore <coughs> very low energy levels to be put into developing that particular market. So in, in presenting this very holistic from start to finish uh, project, I did get the attention of the World Health Organization. We already had an example, though, because in 1999, WHO and some other leading UN organizations had put in a policy for immunization. So immunization is a set volume, set needle size, and it accounts for 5% of the global usage of, in, of syringes. And you can see that WHO put in a policy. The funder was Gavi, which was a funnel organization for all the money in the world for every vaccine and immunization. 
UNICEF became the procurement agent. There were four manufacturers. We were one of them. The syringes get delivered, and it was a very vertical, beautiful program, and it worked fantastically. And as a manufacturer, as an inventor, as someone who wanted to make some money out of this, I was hoping that WHO were going to then put in another policy and follow the same line. But as you can see, it's much more complicated. Not only is it 20 times larger, this market, but there are many funders, many regulatory authorities around the world. Literally every country has three. There were 600 manufacturers, so how do we regulate all of those and put them uh, under the same uh, banner? And there were lots of ministries, hundreds of thousands of healthcare workers, and obviously five billion people who needed to be delivered with safe injections. The era of paper is now dead. It's finished. And there, even this year, um, big organizations in the UN spend something like, uh, there's one organization that I know that spends $600,000 a month on photocopying forms delivering them and getting them back, but they only get 2% return on those bits of paper. So it's highly inefficient. And what we're going to now be looking at solely, and I know there's a hundred, hundreds of examples of this, is a digital solution. So I've just come back from South Africa meeting with Samsung Africa and the GSMA and the MTN mobile network in trying to imagine something that would be able to deliver that very complex chart that I showed you. How can we deliver data back to manufacturers in a very open and transparent way and tell them that that's the way that, uh, that they can get much more accurate um, feedback on their supplies so they know when to make to replenish the stock. We also need to look at, and this is what we're doing, a new way of translating the, tra transmitting the message to the patients. This is a poster made for Tanzania in Swahili where the, the favorite hobby of nearly every elderly gentleman and lady in Tanzania is growing tomatoes. They grow them to the family formula. And in rural areas, this becomes almost a national sport. So we tried this poster out and it was so unbelievably comical to them that they all remembered the message in, in five minutes. And I promise you, it's far more effective than a picture of a mother and a child with have a safe injection. So the program is called Lifesaver. We've now launched it uh, 10 days ago at the World Health Organization. There'll be an announcement made by uh, the DG in May at the World Health Assembly. And we're going to now run what is um, actually the third ever global campaign hosted by the World Health Organization. What is really encouraging also in the WHO getting prepared to do this work, they've done a cost effectiveness study and they now know that a minimum of $14 will be returned for every dollar invested. So that becomes a no-brainer for us to get funding and to get the attention of all those participants in that holistic solution. As I mentioned, it's the third ever global campaign run by WHO. The first one was polio, the second one was hand washing, and so it's a great honor to be you know, leading the charge and, and developing um, this program uh, in WHO's 60-year history and to be in that rarefied air. Um, we are just beginning this global campaign and I invite you to follow me and thank you for listening.